guys. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about your backyard 450 million years ago. What I'm talking about today with the, our fossils is to go along with a lecture PowerPoint that I have uh, for you that gets into much more detail about the environment. Uh, with this uh, talk here in my dining room, I'm really just focusing on the fossils. So uh, we're looking at two very special geological formations. A formation is a unit of rock that is uh, distinctive both uh, across a wide distance and uh, probably most importantly, vertically. So we have um, in the Cincinnati area, different layers of rock that are a little bit different. So they're all kind of a shallow marine uh, Bahamas type of climate. And uh, we'll get into that more later on. But um, the life is different from one formation to the next and the environment was different. So we're looking at different uh, depths of the ocean, uh, different climates, you know, we could be looking at a lot of different things here, even though here in our region, we just have a bunch of gray layers of rock. So um, I wanna talk about our two different geological formations today, the Cope Formation and the Fairview Formation. So I kind of have our fossils organized by those groups. You guys will have some still pictures of these later. I just want to talk about them and then you'll be able to see some much better, uh, more detailed images of them uh, a little later. Um, so the big differences between our fossils, uh, you can probably tell right away, uh, we're looking at size <laughs> for a few of these guys. So <clears throat> um, the other PowerPoint talks about, or the other lecture talks about what groups of animals we see. Now we're kind of breaking them down and talking about how they're different from one another. So let's go to the Cope Formation because it's older and lower. So we always go oldest to youngest in geology. We always start at the bottom and go up toward the youngest and the uppermost uh, layers of strata. So in this layer of rock, we find our little branching forms. These are called bryozoans. And again, they're not plants. We don't have any plants uh, fossilized in the Cincinnati area. All these fossils predate plants by about 100 million years. Uh, so no plants and no bones. All these fossils also predate vertebrates, animals with bones. Um, so these are all little uh, marine invertebrates and are the uh, skeletal bits and pieces left behind from those marine invertebrates. So these guys would pull calcium carbonate out of the sea and use it to build their exoskeletons, like a, a, a structure or a shell. So with the bryozoans, <clears throat> They are doing that and uh, we'll see better <laughs> later on. You guys will have some good images too. Uh, each of the little tiny dots, and this is in your information guide in your lab, would have housed one single tiny little individual creature. Um, and that would have been teeny tiny, a little tiny animal. Um, we know that partly because we have bryozoans alive today. This is a very common group, uh, but half the things you pick up from lakes or rivers or the ocean that you think of are seaweed, they're actually colonies of bryozoa. We have soft ones today, as well as some hard ones. But here we just have hard ones. Uh, we also have some nautiloid shells, uh, these long straight shells left by uh, a type of cephalopod related to the squid and cuttlefish. Um, we have a gastropod or sea snail, which today are among the most diverse groups of animals on the planet during the Ordovician time period. You know, just a couple different varieties are just kind of starting out. Um, and I think that's what's really cool about uh, looking at fossils and going back into geologic time is we're looking at groups that are just kind of getting a leg up, I guess, and, um, you know, it, it, that are super abundant and successful groups of organisms alive today. And other groups like trilobites that used to be really common and just dominate the planet, but now are long gone. We don't have them anymore. Um, they went extinct 250 million years ago. So there is a little trilobite, this is about half of a trilobite, is a little butt here. It's kind of uh, curled up as they do. They are arthropods related to insects, crabs, um, you know, uh, actually their closest relative, closest living relative is the pill bug. There's little roly polies in your basement. Those are not insects. They're some weird type of air breathing crustacean. So um, that's a, kind of a cool thing. Okay, another uh, little brachiopod or a, a lamp shell. So we find a lot of these. Uh, brachiopods and bryozoans make up some of the most abundant fossils in the, well, in both of these formations. 
Okay, uh, and the nice little delicate, very thin little brachiopod shell. It's kind of broken actually uh, from the cope formation. And a rock from the cope that shows us uh, something very distinctive about the cope formation, and that's that we're looking at mostly mud. We have shale, and it's very, very fine-grained, very delicate powdery material. And we see in this particular rock, and every time I go out fossil hunting in the cope formation, I try to find something like this because it's very cool, you see all these little uh, kind of holes. Sometimes you can find trilobite footprints where trilobites actually crawled across the mud and left behind like little scratch marks. It's pretty cool. But these are actually the burrows and traces left behind by worms and other things that are kind of burrowing around in the ancient muddy seafloor. That's kind of cool. But what's special about this is that in order for something that delicate like trilobite footprints or worm burrows to be preserved, this had to have been a very calm environment, right? We're not dealing with a whole lot of wave action, a whole lot of turbulence here in the Cope Formation. One way we know that is because we get things like tracks and trails and very fine-grained deposition of mud, shale, which wouldn't form in a much more turbulent, high-energy environment. Uh, another reason, too, is, and uh, it, just to... Uh, you know, kind of uh, spoiler alert, uh, the Cope Formation fossils tend to be smaller bodied than the Fairview Formation. We'll get to the Fairview in a bit. But these little bryozoans, these little delicate branching forms in the Cope versus these big chunky encrusting forms in the Fairview, why? Why is that? Well, Think about what these guys had to live with. Think about what they had to deal with when they were living animals. We can't just think about them as dead things. They lived in this environment and thrived in this environment for tens of millions of years. So what were they dealing with? Why was this guy able to afford having such a small, delicate shell, and not just him, but these other guys too, uh, brachiopods as well, especially this really thin one that ended up being broken, and we have all these crawling forms like uh, snails and all these swimming forms like nautiloids. And we don't see as much of that in the Fairview. Instead, we get big chunky forms. These would have been, this is just a fragment of a much bigger piece of a bryozoan that would have clung onto rocks, onto other structures, onto other bryozoa. Uh, we have, uh, I love these brachiopods, big old brachiopods with these big thick ridges. Okay, these have really thick shells. And then, and even the smaller brachiopods, they have ridges as well. And then we're looking at this rock, a very typical rock from the Fairview Formation, big old chunky bry uh, brachiopod here, some nice kind of chunky bryozoans, and uh, something that we also notice is, yeah, while well, we're not seeing a whole lot of fossils, but we do see evidence of life in the Cope uh, rock, in the Fairview rock, there's loads of evidence of life, but it's so chopped up and these fossils are so broken and tumbled together that there's no way we could ever have any little footprints preserved in something like this. In fact, this all tells us that this was deposited in a very high energy, very turbulent environment. So lots of wave action going on. So let's think about what the animals look like too as they were living. Um, these ridges, these ridges, you know, uh, this is always a kind of a question and answer thing I can't really do with you guys so much, but um, think about uh, if you wanted to eat a bunch of sour cream dip, because who doesn't, what kind of potato chip would you use, right? You want to use your little, you know, the little thin ones that are going to break? No, you use, and I think you know, ruffles, right? Because Ruffles have ridges. Well, what's the point of that? More surface area for more sour cream? Maybe, but it's strength, okay? Ruffles are less likely to break. So, you know, brachiopods knew that. Uh, well, they didn't know it, but, you know, their shells, uh, you know, reflect that same kind of pressure. They're dealing with, you know, th these shells can't break. The animal would die if its shell broke. So it's dealing with something that is causing a lot of, you know, it needs to be strong, it needs to be structurally sound. Um, that's not a problem for the cope. Uh, so these little tiny brachiopods, you'll barely be able to see this guy. This, this shell is like paper thin, and it was when he was alive too. Um, that seems silly, because aren't there predators? Uh, he would have been buried in the ground, that's not a big deal. But the point is, is that uh, these guys are using 
um, you know, calcium, carbon, other things out of the sea water to create their skeletons, their exoskeletons, like their shells. If they are in an environment that doesn't have a whole lot of turbulence and wave action, they're not going to expend the energy making a big old chunky shell that they don't need. They're going to look like this. So these guys were living in an easier, uh, calmer environment, whereas in the Fairview, these guys are just clinging on. You know, literally, these huge encrusting bryozoans are, you know, the, the, these are structures that would go all around rocks and other bryozoans. These are reef builders. These are forming some of the original reefs, not coral reefs, because we don't have really corals evolved yet, but bryozoans are doing it. Um, so we're looking at very different climate, uh, well, not, not climate so much, I'm sorry, very different depths of the seawater. Climate didn't change a whole heck of a lot from the deposition of the cope, which again is lower, to the fair view, which is younger and higher. But we are looking at going from a deeper water environment to a shallower water environment. Now, if you saw my the sedimentary rocks talk where I had the, those rocks and then I took a piece of coal and put it on top because if we get into even younger rock in other parts of Kentucky, we're getting into uh, near shore, like swamp and river environments. That's land. Um, we're going from deep water to shallow water to land environments. Here we're going from deep to shallow. We're looking at sea level drop, and that sea level drop correlates to a mass extinction event. So all these guys went extinct, you know, and I'm not saying that we have these fossils because they went extinct. We don't see loads of dead animals at an extinction event. That just doesn't happen. Um, they were, these were thriving in their environments, but they, they, they didn't persist much past uh, the time period when these rocks were laid down here in the Cincinnati area. And this is a world famous fossil site. It's called the Cincinnatian worldwide. So this specific time period at the very, very end of the Ordovician that culminates in one, the, the first major mass extinction event we've had since complex life evolved on Earth is called the Cincinnatian. And that's worldwide, whether you're looking at rocks of this age in Morocco or China or Australia, it's called the Cincinnatian. That's pretty cool. Um, but anyway, so the evidence for something like sea level fluctuations, 450, 444, actually million years ago, is because of the lifestyle of the organisms. So we have to apply biology to this, apply what we know and understand about animals today that live in the seas. They can serve as a good analogy for what these guys are dealing with. We have to understand sedimentation and how something like a big, chunky, broken up, fragmented piece of limestone would have formed in a very different environment than this nice, delicate, fine-grained layers of shale. And um, another thing too, oh, the, the, the preservation quality of the fossils. We're not going to get little footprints and worm burrows in the Fairview but we find them extensively in the cope. And even though we don't find as many fossils often in the cope formation, we do, uh, when we do find them, they tend to be more complete. Whereas in the Fairview, they're likely, likely to be broken up. So even after these animals died, their little bodies were tumbling around in the Fairview um, and subject to lots of breakage. So we're going from a deeper water environment that was below the depth to which hurricanes can really tear up the seafloor to a sea that is becoming shallower and shallower, and now we're dealing with a, what's called storm wave base, the lowest point to which storms, like hurricanes, because this would have been in the tropics, so lots of hurricanes, um, these are animals that had to put up with hurricanes and survive those sort of things. These guys, uh, they were below that, they were deeper, they didn't have to deal with that sort of thing. So anyway, we got the fossils, <clears throat> uh, the biology of the animals in the first place, and the geology all telling us about these different habitats that these guys dealt with. So back here to our screen, so these are, um, and the PowerPoint, will, uh, the lecture that I do on the PowerPoint will deal more with this, but some of these organisms, and again, no plants, uh, we're looking at some nice delicate branching bryozoans here, some crinoids, which are in the starfish family, some early corals called horn corals, and uh, these are all animals, and part of the reason why we know that is because they all have relatives alive today. We still have crinoids, we still have bryozoans, uh, we don't have trilobites, but we still have coral, of course. They, they dominate our seas today. So uh, then I have some images of some of these different fossils uh, for you guys to identify, and that's also in your 
uh, sheet. Uh, so, so in your lab itself, is we're looking at some good fossils. And then we have the difference between fossils of the Cope formation um, and fossils of the Fairview Formation, and you know, uh, hopefully the little real ones that you would have played with in lab are a little bit better than these drawings, but I hope they give you a sense of how life was very, very different in di whoopsie, different parts of the sea. Um, and at the same time, you know, the, there would have been fossils, you know, there would have been life living in the deeper parts of the sea at the same time as the shallow. It's just that over one time period here in Cincinnati, we're going from one to the other. Laterally, that would have been huge. It would have been a continental shelf, which today are you know many hundreds of miles in in a you know area. Um, so anyway, it's kind of cool to think that here in our in northern Kentucky, in our literal backyards, is a little piece of uh, of a m much different and um, you know very exciting environment that tells us a lot about global things going on, global climate fluctuations. This extinction event wasn't just in Cincinnati, it was worldwide. And we have great direct evidence for that here in our area. So anyway, so watch the lecture over the whole PowerPoint as well. I just wanted to show you the fossils and kind of see the differences between them. So thanks a lot guys, and I uh, hope you enjoy this lab.